All right, welcome to the ultimate Dynasty wrap-up show as we're here to wrap up the Dynasty documentary. Uh, the Dynasty documentary series is streaming on Apple TV, and we couldn't be more pleased to have joining us the executive producer and the author of the book, The Dynasty, Jeff Benedict, and the director of the series, Matt Hamachek, Matt Smith, along with Paul Perillo and Fred Kirsch. Guys, thank you so much. You guys are on tour. You know, everybody's taking a crack at you guys, and we just wanted to have a discussion about can you believe this project has come to light, has been aired, has been viewed? You saw, you've got to the finish line. Is that a bit of a relief, maybe, that you've got there? I thought you were going to say, and we just wanted to have a crack at you, too. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. We'll see. There might be a crack, there might be a crack here or there. <laughs> no, it feels good to be at, uh, to be at this stage of the project um, because it, it seems like a really long time ago when we started. I was flipping through some... Uh, photographs on my phone yesterday i was looking for something completely unrelated to this and i actually came across a picture of you Oof. and uh matt and myself and uh justin wilkes who was uh, the executive producer from imagine um we were, it was like when we first met here in yeah, the archives to it was the very first stuff. time yeah. and uh you know when you look at the dates on those pictures it's it's a reminder of how long this project has been going on jeff did you uh, <coughs> for those who are watching and listening Let's just kind of recap a little bit. You yep. wrote the book. Yep. Was it your intention when you wrote this book, a la Tiger, there's going to be a documentary, there's going to be a series behind this, is your hope? Um, yeah, for sure. And, and uh, I, I talked about it or broached the subject even before I started writing the book. So I had spent about a year with the team, and I'd met you by then, and uh, I think I'd even met you, Fred. Um, but before I started putting pen to paper, you know, I was thinking about the potential for um, other ways that the story could be told after the book was published. And, uh, and so it, it was an early consideration. It's something that I raised with the team and with the organization. And then uh, as soon as I turned the, the narrative in, which was right after Tom went to see Robert to tell him that he, was, he had decided to leave, and they made the phone call to Bill and to Jonathan, I wrote that last scene like within a few days of that actually happening and then I was done because I was actually done kind of like Matt being done with the film until we're kind of waiting for the last thing that he would put in. I was in the same situation with the book. I had everything done except the ending and then that happened and as soon as that happened I turned it in and then there's like six or seven months before the book's on sale and I immediately pivoted to starting on the, the steps to be taken to turn it into a docuseries. You know, we're going to get into, you know, the details, but something you just said made me think, you know, you had done everything except the ending. Yeah. If the Patriots had had an amazing season in 23, like yeah. gone to the playoffs or even better, you know, yeah. would Apple have been willing to hold off or would they have come out at the same time anyway? I think that, it, well, look, if they had, like, let's say – I think it would have been up to me uh, to say, okay, I think what we should do is we should take the 10 that we've already had. Because, you know, we basically were done by maybe even midway through the season or something like that. Yeah. They had been going to, on a Super Bowl run, and they got there. Or something happened that was just extraordinary. Maybe I, we could have gone and said, okay, I, Apple, can you give us a little bit more money? We want to do episode 11 or something uh, like see. that yeah. so that that's the kind of that's the way yeah. the conversation would have happened yeah, and cause, so because you hear the conspiracy theorists mm -hmm. oh they time it's coming out oh, yeah. just right you know it, it's yeah. so the one thing that we did know for a very long time was that it was basically this question of apple came to me and they said how long do you think you're going to need to make something like this and if i had had my true druthers i probably would have said i need three and a half four years but that's not the way tv works they want it right as soon as possible right so i so what we came to an agreement on was that basically the week after the super bowl in 2024 gave us two and a half years that was more or less enough time to go make this thing and that's the date that we had locked in stone and the reason for that was just like myself and every other football fan out there the Super Bowl happens and you start to go through football withdrawal. And so if, you know, it's like, well, let's give people the greatest football story of all time. And that's, it was locked in stone for yeah. two and a half years, basically, that yeah. that was going to happen that way. Yeah. Um, so, Matt, as you're from New York, correct? I, I, am, I live in New York. I'm from D.C. Okay. Um, so you're not a Patriots fan. You're not a New no. Englander and everything like no. that. As you experience the 
aftermath and the and everybody uh, indulging in this, have you noticed a distinctive flavor between the reaction in the six state region <laughs> and yes. the entire rest of the country? Yes. Does yes. it surprise you? Um, it does surprise me uh, because I this was all kind of new to me, right? I didn't understand anything when I first started making this thing, right? And so the good part about that is that you get to talk to the 70 plus players and coaches and front office exec, the rivals and everything. And these are a lot of these questions like, why did you decide to go with Drew Bledsoe or uh, Tom Brady over Drew Bledsoe or questions that these guys have been asked over and over and over again. And they sort of have their answers. But I think it helps when somebody who genuinely doesn't know the answer to these questions and is actually curious, asks them these things because it elicits new answers because you say, I think a lot of times things like that, history has proven them to be the greatest coaching decisions in, in the history of the NFL, right? They, they, made the, they made the obvious choice because history has proven it right. At the time, it wasn't like that. And that was always the thing is, I, I don't know the answers to these questions. I want to know why when, every, when all the archive I'm watching is saying that this was a horrible decision, why did you think it was right then? And what was it like to be in the room at that point in time? So I didn't know any of this stuff. And I had to sit back and listen and just ask follow-up questions and just and 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 hear and kind of get out of the way and let these people talk so when this thing came out i think you know i had an inkling of the fact that i surely knew that in boston the reaction was going to be strong one way or the other right because there's sort of this where we're at the stadium right now we're having this conversation and it, within a 50 mile plus radius of this place there is a giant bubble right <laughs> and and the reaction within this bubble has been a mixed bag, but a very vocal mixed bag, right? Everybody's on Twitter and they're saying all these different things and it's like all these conspiracy theories and stuff. And I'm just sitting there just like, guys, I have no idea what any of these people are talking about. Now nationally, it's just like, hey, they sort of viewed this thing the way that I viewed this thing, which was, this wasn't my team. I don't have a dog in this fight. We're just gonna sit back and we're gonna watch. And it's sort of this balanced thing where some people can look at episode five and see it the way that I see it, which is it's a love letter to Bill Belichick and what he did when his back was up against the wall. And as he puts it, he lost the greatest quarterback of all time for a season. And that's what episode five is. Now, the people in Boston who are convinced that somehow this is some kind of a Bill Belichick hit job, they just completely overlook all of that. And they all they pay attention to is one line in the middle of the episode when Tom Brady Sr. says, Bill, he's cold, he's calculating. If you're not on the team, you're out of state, out of mind. That's the only line they hear. And then the other, you know, 30 something minutes of that thing just doesn't exist. And this is the thing that I keep seeing. And I think this is something that goes on in our society in general today is if you believe something, you cannot be talked off of that, that belief, no matter what. And you will cherry pick every piece of evidence that helps support the thing that you already believe. Yeah. And, and, and you'll accumulate all those things and you will ignore everything else. And that, and, and then you have, it's, it's, it's there, it's proof, it's yeah. obvious. And you know? before this even came out, there were people saying it's going to it's going to be without seeing a, a Belichick hit piece. Right. Not, not, hit not just or, that. Or not, not just that. Yeah. Not just that. Yeah. Not just that. Right. There was some 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 guy it goes and he writes, oh, it's it's going to be it's all this thing. It's going to be the Robert Kraft, Kraft puff piece that helps get him into the Hall of Fame. So so this is what I thought when I read that. I was like, all right. Now, let's imagine this conspiracy to be the case where there's a puppet master who's sitting around and he's pulling the strings to get into the Hall of Fame. OK, so what are the Hall of Fame decisions that you know, would have gone into it. What, would, what are the Hall of Fame moments that would help this case? Bill Belichick leaves the Jets. Everybody in the league basically thinks that Bill Belichick can't coach to save his life. There's one person who does. It's Robert Kraft. He's not only does he believe in it, but he's also willing to give up a first round draft pick in order to get him. Proves out, as history has proven, to be a Hall of Fame choice. Even, you know, Mike Lombardi said that. It's a Hall of, uh, Hall of Fame decision. The next thing would have been the 2011 CBA stuff, right? He, Robert Kraft comes in, he talks to Jeff Saturday, they, you know, it, it, under very difficult personal circumstances and they have this, they, they, they come to an agreement, players and coaches, there's no lockout, et cetera, et cetera. Then it would have been all about all the deals and the TV, you know, the TV things, all the money he's made for the league. None of these things are in the series. Right, and then and I they go, are and, in the book. Yeah. But they're not in the series. But right. Let's, right. Go, let's go back to then also in 2001. So we're talking about the greatest coaching decision in the history of all time in the NFL, right? Now, in the middle of this, Robert Kraft admits that he didn't think it was, the, it was unfair to Drew and that he admits that he was on the other side of it in the time because of his personal connections to Drew. Now, again, 
if this was some puff piece, why would he ever admit to something like that? So I'm sitting here and I'm listening to all these guys say this stuff. and I'm just like, guys, like, what are you talking about? Just watch the thing. I think people outside of New England who aren't part of the one thing I did learn is that don't have a side, don't have a side, haven't been covering this team, uh, you know, all sorts of things. And there's these turf battles that have been happening in New England for all oh these God. years, right? Every journalist <laughs> in this place, every, every journalist, and this, I, didn't, I didn't know this, and it's wild, because from an outside, you're just like, this is just insane. Every journalist, everybody goes around, they say, oh, well, so-and-so, he's, 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 a, uh, he's a Belichick guy, right? And then, oh, this guy, he's, he, he's a Kraft guy. And, like, you know, and, and he's, this guy's a Tom guy and all this kind of stuff. I'll give you the and, roster if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, no, but I didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't understand, I didn't understand any of this. And so I'm just sitting there. And so when this documentary comes out, within this little bubble that we're talking about, it's not just a documentary that's made by a guy who doesn't really care about you know any of this nonsense it's how does this fit into this larger this vast conspiracy of what side this is on and, and and all these kind of things and you know i go back to like bill burr was just on the pat mcafee show a couple of days ago and he said uh, one of the guys there is like a diehard new england fan and he's like oh i don't like it at all it should have been called the evil empire and, and it should have been called the dynasty and then and, and then bill burr is like yeah because some nerd who went to film school made the thing. And I am that nerd <laughs> who could care less about all of this other nonsense that's going on. I just had a, sim a simple task, and here's what it was. I interviewed Ernie Adams for the first time. It was the first time I ever spoke to him. And one line that's in episode 10, he says, he says, everybody at the beginning of every year wants to win the Super Bowl, but not everybody is willing to do what it takes to get there. And when he said those words to me in that moment, a light bulb went off in my head. It said, this is the question that you're trying to ask. What does it take to get there? And in a somewhat cold way, the patriots and all the people I talked to were really a conduit just to get to the answer to that question. And every time you're telling a movie, you're, you know, look, you could just do the timeline version of the movie. That first this happens, and this happens, and this happens, and this happens, and this happens. Once you figure out what that question is, it drives every decision you make. And that was the only thing I had an interest in. And normally, my opinion is, I really don't like doing, I, I don't like watching, nor, nor did I really have any interest in making a 10-part series about anything, because the truth is, the more time you spend trying, you know, for doing 10 episodes as opposed to two or three, the further you have to get away from just answering that central mm -hmm. question, because there is other things that you naturally have to cover a little bit of. I really like making Tiger, because it was a two-episode thing, it was two one and a half hours. That really allowed me to say, even sort of be ruthless in the approach of, if it isn't answering this question, the, the question for Tiger, which to me was, this guy's a canvas that everybody wants to paint something onto. If, if, if there isn't a moment in an interview or an archive that isn't getting to that, that sort of thesis, then I'm not touching it. Mm -hmm. And that's what drove everything with the, the, the sort of, what does it take to get here is what drove everything in this one. And so, you know, again, I don't have a dog in any of these fights that are going on. And um, but it's, you know, on one hand, it's infuriating to see because you're just like, guys, just watch the thing and enjoy it. You know, there's a lot of great stuff in here. Well, to the point of like, you know, you found that question, that yeah, ultimate yeah, yeah. question. How much, though, did the interviews drive, you know, the direction of the documentary? And were you surprised by any of the answers in that? it changed how we were looking at Absolutely. the direction of the documentary. Tons. Yeah. A, a great example of that was in episode six. So we're interviewing Dion Branch, and we're having this conversation about the things that you would talk to Dion Branch about. I'm, I'm in the chair, I'm talking to him, and it's like, you know, we didn't know at the time that we were gonna not um, go into great detail about the 38 and 39 Super Bowls. So I'm asking about MV being an MVP and all these kind of things. We're talking about football stuff. And I get a text message because I work off of, when I'm interviewing people, I have a laptop in front of me that has an internet connection so I can, I can get feedback from producers, from Jeff, from anybody who's in the room saying, hey, by the way, you know, he, the, the person you're interviewing used a pronoun instead of saying uh, Tom, right? So you need to just remind, hey, could you, could you, uh, could you say it one more time, but just uh, can you say Tom so that people know who you're talking about? Just things like that, right? In the middle of the interview with Dion Branch, um, one of the producers, Vindy Anton, texts me and he goes, by the way, I just found this article. He wasn't even in the studio. He was, he was away. Uh, it was someplace else. And he said, I think Dion might have known Aaron. So I see that and I just turn to Dion and I say, hey, tell me about Aaron. And you know how episode six starts out? It starts out with Aaron in front of the green screen right. and everything, right? And then you cut to Chill. Dion Branch and he's sitting there and there's this pause. 
and he's thinking and he's what he, what is going on there is he's thinking I, I you don't hear me say it but i just said the i just said tell me about aaron and then he goes he corrects me he goes we used to call him chico man and you just see that and when i asked him that question and i saw his eyes change and and he looked down and he started to talk about how did you not see that Dion? Yeah. how did you not see it right and then and i think he might have got a little emotional yeah but that's yeah, the, that that's strong. what was the most that's what was the most shocking thing about that entire story and and asking people about that was i didn't know for sure that we were ever going to do the aaron hernandez episode that wasn't like a preconceived wow. thing right yeah, that, you no, didn't go in that's that interesting right I did, yeah no well, we had, like... you have no idea but th but what i will say is this what made it worth doing to me was i think that you know ernie talked about this idea of we're getting first round talent at fourth round price we had heard some things but these are minor things these are bar fights this is you know marijuana use like you know whatever big nothings but there was risk right so that started to get towards the question of what does it take to get there what are the risks you take things like that right it of course nobody had any idea that what was going to happen was going to happen so that's part one of it but the other thing that was so impressive to me was how much everybody still cared deeply about this guy it, this wasn't just some somebody that came through and and it was all this bad stuff. It was people love this guy and they still care about him and they're still haunted to this day that they didn't see these things. That was fascinating to me. And so when I started to see that kind of stuff, like everything in this series, it was, I think my general philosophy was the thing that's never happened before the Patriot story is that you get all 70 plus of these people in a room and you let, and, and they get to talk, right? In and of itself. Yeah. A tremendous accomplishment. <clears throat> they, it, it, but it was, I w I'm just going to get out of the way and I'm going to let them tell, I'm going to ask questions and I'm going to let them tell their stories and that's it. But in, in the Hernandez episode in particular, it was, this still, this is still an open wound in a lot of ways for a lot of these guys. And in particular for that one, let's take some care and make sure we're not putting our thumb on the scale in any way, shape or form. It's just get out of the way and let these guys tell their stories. So that's fascinating as, as you hear that. And I want to bring you into this because it's yeah. something you and I talked about. One of the, the criticisms from the people in this area, as you're yeah. talking about, is, geez, they gloss over 38 and 39. Yeah, yeah. Your intention going into this, sort of a blank slate, but it's in the book. Jeff's written about 38 and 39. Yeah. We're going to cover 38 and 39. Oh, boy. Look what happened when I just mentioned Aaron Hernandez. Yeah. And creatively, that takes you to a different spot. Yeah. Because of the interviews that you're asking about, like you're not going in there going, episode six got to be Aaron Hernandez, and I'm gonna, you know, I had, you I learn had, stuff. I had at one point in time there was a, Jeff. Jeff saw the early versions of it. There were episodes that were cut where the 2002 season happens. They don't make the playoffs. What does that mean? Why did that happen? I asked all the players what happened after the first one, right? And then you get into 2003, and then you get into okay. Lawyer Malloy, uh, Rod Rodney, Rodney's brought in, lawyer's gone. We get into the hole. There was the practice where Rodney went after somebody, and then, like, the whole team piles on top of him, and everybody's fighting, and Bill's smiling in the NFL films. But, you know, the whole thing, right? Then Tom Jackson says what he's going to say, and da 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 and he's like, well. And then they go to Buffalo, and then uh, they lose by the exact same score that the final game of the season. They win by the exact same score. All of it was cut. There was an entire, there was an entire the beginning of the episode about, like, uh, Teddy Bruschi's stroke. It's not that we just didn't think about it or we didn't ask the questions. We made a creative choice very consciously for every single thing that was done. This is the story that we want to tell that gets to this question of what does it take? Now, some people will come in and they'll say, you know, Matt, this was this great moment where Tom Jackson said this thing about Bill and then the whole team had his back and they went out and they and they did great and like, you know, all this kind of stuff. Well, that's true to me. There was another version of that same kind of moment where something happened and everybody had Bill's back. And to me, the more interesting one was they become Goliath and the entire league has their hooks out and their knives out for the Patriots. So everybody in the league is doing it, but they kept, the Patriots are the ones who get caught, you know, doing the, the taping and everything, right? And Bill is betrayed by his former mentee. I'm using Scott yeah. Pioli's words here. And then, and then, this is when the culture of the Patriot, the Patriot way, which I know, you know, some people don't ever want to use that expression. And Tom and Bill have both said that. But this is when everything that Bill has created here with Tom and with Robert, and it's all going to be tested, right? Any other team, if this happened to the Jets, the whole team would have fallen apart. They might have gone one one game the entire season. That's right. And instead, you have this moment where Teddy Bruschi 
comes into the locker room after that after a game and says, "How do we feel about being coached by Bill Belichick?" And then he goes, "Oh, and yeah. everybody was on, and on everybody board. Yeah. has Bill's back." Now, if I have to make a choice between a one week story, basically, which is the Lawyer Malloy leaving and Rodney and all that kind of stuff, versus an entire season when the whole team rallied around their coach at, a, at one of his lowest moments. And they go on the run of all runs, and they are saying F you to everybody in their path. And they're doing it because how dare you invalidate everything we've done because of a signal? I'm quoting Teddy Bruschi there, right? There's vengeance. There's anger. There's great stuff in that. So, yeah, when you start to hear those kind of things, you're like, I'm sorry, but yeah. I'd rather be with that team than the team that just replicated the exact, you know, we got there. We showed what made this team so special in 01, right? We heard it. And all those players said, yeah, the other ones were great, but being on the team that went from a non-Super Bowl team to a Super Bowl team, that was the one that was the most important. And then, as we all know, the poor guys that won the, 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 the second three had to spend their entire lives coming back for Alumni Weekend and hearing Willie McGinnis and Teddy Bruschi say, you guys aren't part of the, you, aren't, you guys aren't anything until you get the part. three, right? Yeah. Right. So I'm just saying, you know, then the next thing is, okay, why do you have to spend an entire episode on uh, Matt Castle? Well, let's see what the greatest coach of all time does when, in his words, he loses the greatest quarterback of all time, one of the greatest players of all time. His back's up against the wall. What does he do? He has an 11-5 and season, and he pulls off one of the greatest coaching feats of all time. And in the midst of this, everybody's saying they're starting to wonder about the greatness of Tom Brady, right? That's more interesting to me because that's the question of what does it take to get to that level, right? Now, that might not be an example of when they right. got to that level, but that is part of what it takes to get and, there. And going back to what you said, you're coming at it from a curiosity standpoint. Yeah. Those of us who are here never worried that Tom Brady wasn't going to get his job back. But I can understand where somebody looking at it with fresh eyes would think yeah. that. And, and I think you did a very – very deft job of going back to Michigan and started to build the mindset of Tom Brady of, you know, beginning with the Drew Henson and, and all these other things that make up wh how he ticks. And I thought you did a really good job at that. Um, just what was leading up to Tom Brady eventually saying, I'm out of here. I'm well, look, out of here. It's not. It's also you said I did a really good. I, and I understand I put yeah. it together and everything yeah. with a team of amazing people and Jeff and we were all doing it. But here's what I would say is this is what they were saying. Right. Everybody in there was saying that everybody that we talked to, every player that was close to Tom, his family, they were all talking about how his entire yeah. life he feels like the guy who's been sort of passed over and, right. and everything, right? And so, Tom. and so then we would go into the archives. We had 35,000 plus hours, mostly, much of which you've been overseeing for many, many years. Um, and, uh, you know, we would find things that would help elucidate the things that we were hearing in the interview chair, right? And so when we went to the Michigan story, it was, you know, finding those moments where you see Henson coming in and all the, all the fans are cheering, Henson, you know, it's like all that stuff, right? It's, it's, and so everybody talks about this and I'm trying to put myself in Tom's shoes. He has come back from the four game deflate gate thing one more time where he leaves and the show goes on without him. It's three and one when he comes back, right? The year before, a couple of years before his, his, his replacement has been drafted essentially, right? And this is a guy f from everybody that talks about him says he always feels like he's sort of getting passed over and overlooked and all this kind of stuff. And this all leads up just to not be f being fully appreciated. appreciated. Sure. Yeah. And so finally we get to this, the, the Falcon Super Bowl and there's this moment where he's on his knees. He's just thrown the pick six. And Nor Princiati, the journalist, comes in and she says, maybe Belichick was right. Maybe every quarterback at a certain age falls off of a cliff. And, and all this stuff. And then, you know, it's like just from a human perspective, the idea that you have been doubted and all these things and people have just accused you of cheating and you've been forced not – because you actually did something necessarily, but because it is more reasonable than, it, 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 more whatever the language of the Deflategate report was, it's more reasonable than not that you may have known something that da -da 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 that happened. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's all nonsense. And then, and then here you are, you're on your knees, you throw a pick six, and then somehow you find a way to get up and launch the greatest comeback in NFL, if not sports history. Right. 
on the biggest stage imaginable. It's like, okay. The fuel he gets from the doubters was amazing. And and even in that moment, Brady says it in the documentary, it wasn't, oh, I threw the pick six, we're gonna lose this game. I threw the pick six, they're gonna say I'm washed up. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a human, that's the thing is, most of the time when you're making these documentaries, like um, I made something about public defenders in the deep south, right? And so it's like these these small stories that people that nobody's ever heard of before they they gave up jobs in a in a nice law firm to do this thing that they're passionate about. So nobody knows them. So you take the, these people and you build them up into being larger than life characters because you want to make the story interesting for somebody to watch, right? And then you take the cases that they have and you build those things up and you make it, it you, you you make them seem larger than life. With this story and stories like this, whether it was Tiger or. Uh, the Amanda Knox thing that I also worked on, not as a director, but as a writer and producer and editor, you sometimes find these larger than life characters and stories. And what you want to do is you want to show people why they're humans just like us. They may happen to be on the biggest stage imaginable going through things that we can't possibly fathom, but the emotions and the things that drive them are the same thing as all of us have. You know, if you're a doctor. How am I going to be looked at? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Or people doubt me. Yeah. People are going to pass me over because I'm too old. Yeah. These are like universal stories that 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 trust me, I know. Yeah, three of us are off there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but I'm just saying like that this is this is what makes us human beings. These are t- stories that have been told for, you know, centuries. Yeah. And and so this is this is the kind of thing and once and like I said, once you get back to the central question of what does it take to get there and that being your driving principle, then that answers your question. And what it took for Tom Brady to get there is yeah. It, it, the thing that I always found fascinating is everybody talks about how hard Bill was on him and everything, right? I always, and, I, and this is not anybody said this, it's just my outside perspective. I always wonder if he had had any other coach who had never, who is not always keeping that carrot just one foot out of reach constantly throughout all these years with the Super Bowls that he would accumulate and the stardom that he was. He was a global celebrity very early on. Would Would he have done it on his own? I don't know the answer to this question. But I wonder if that style of coaching is part of what motivated him to be great. And I go back to this, um, you know, I have it here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull this thing up, but there's this Tom Landry quote um, that I think is great. The job of a football coach is to make men do what they don't want to do in order to achieve what they've always wanted to be. And it's like, if that doesn't describe Bill Belichick and his coaching style, I don't know what does. Right. Yeah. And it's, and so, I don't know. I just I, look as an outsider. I think all of these things are endlessly fascinating, and I sort of got taken on this journey just talking to people. And yeah, yeah it would. And, and this is a very long, long answer to your question. No, but, no, it's, you know, it's, it's fascinating, fascinating to me. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned something earlier about Belichick and the, you know the Spygate episode, him feeling betrayed. I, a lot of people I heard say, why did they use this state trooper from you know New Jersey? I thought that was a great way of kind of going full circle on loyalty. Betrayal. Betrayal and loyalty. Yeah. And, and, you know, he, even though he was undercover with, you know, bad people, he felt bad about betraying them. Yeah. Like, you know, like I got their confidence. I got their their loyalty to me. And then I had to betray them as yeah. part of my job. And I had to get out, I, you know. And I thought that was a great way to weave in how Bill felt. Not that he was working with bad people, but he felt betrayed. Yeah, he felt betrayed. And then when it, when we get back to him later in the that's the the, the right. New Jersey State Police guy, he says, "It's right after all the stuff about Eric," and he goes, "Betrayal. It's sometimes it's really hard to swallow." And then he takes a big gulp, yeah. right? And it's and it's like, I don't know this this. It's like that that's that to me is fascinating, right? Yeah. Is how you take this guy that happened to be the guy that confiscated the tape and the camera and all this stuff. And that's what he talks about. Yeah. And this is a story about betrayal and then what the team does. Because, I mean, that's part of the Vengeance story is everybody there in the building felt like they had been betrayed maybe by Eric, but also by the league in general, right? Yes. You hypocrites. Yeah. You're all doing this. That's, it's, as Ernie said, that's why they all cover their mouth, right. right? And how dare you try to invalidate everything that we have accomplished that we co- – because you, you guys know. We've, talk, they, we've seen them talk about it. They come in every day. They're 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 all grinding away to find any edge. They're running the hills. They're lifting the weights in the off season. All that stuff to just get a little bit better. And now everything is going to be invalidated because of this one thing that everybody else is doing. And then you get mad and you go and yeah. as, as Rodney Harrison says, "F them all." Right. Yeah. F them all. Now that to me, again, just comes back to the oh, why didn't you cover thirty eight, thirty nine? It's like because because that to me is much more interesting. Yeah. Not because of scandal, 
which is what everybody likes to say. Oh, you just wanted to get eyeballs and all this stuff. It's like, no, it's, it's, a, more, it's a more interesting human emotion than just the foundation of this thing is set and then we're going to watch the foundation kind of accomplish it over and over and over again. It's this is new. This is different. This is a different emotion and this is a different thing. And that is fascinating to me. Yeah. So that to me, there was, there was two different sort of things. And I, and I go back to what you said a while ago about answering the question, you know, like, you, what what does it take? Yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody wants it, but is everybody willing to do it? And I and I wanted to tie that to something Scott Pioli said. Yeah. Toward the beginning about the narcotic, you know, yeah. the, the winning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you sort of, I think, really follow that through. You guys did a great job, I thought, of following through with that same theme. And I'm wondering, when you got all of those different things, you know, like so now they told you to stop taping, but you still taped from that area where you weren't supposed. Oh, uh, now now we kind of fell off a little bit in in '08 and '09. You know, and 10 comes around, we're going to take a little bit of a chance on Aaron Hernandez. Mm. You know, do you feel like that maybe was part of what some of those things, like, is everybody willing to do what it takes to get there? Like, I, yeah, feeding and, that and narcotic but, almost? But, but here's, here's, the, here's the thing I want to be very – the answer is yes, but I want to be very clear about one thing. When I say yes, I'm not trying to say – they were willing to take a murderer in order to win. Because, but no, but no I'm just saying, you're not that. saying that. Absolutely. You're not saying no that. One could but if I say that. yes, then the, the lunatics that are, that, are, <laughs> right. that, are, that are DMing me on we Twitter every single day are going to assume that that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> you're getting them too. Anyway, my point is they were willing to take a slight risk because they were going to get first-round talent at a fourth-round price. That is part of it. And part of it is... But a lot of teams had him off the board. Okay. Completely off. But guess what? They had brought in other people. Remember, Randy Moss had run over a meter maid or whatever the story was, right? Corey Dillon. Okay. Okay. Corey Dillon. Guess what? They he came into the Patriot way and everything worked out. And as Robert Kraft says in the thing, we hoped and and it was our belief and we hoped that the Patriot way would whatever the 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 rest of the line is. Bill's relationship with Urban Meyer. I'm sure that played into it. You know, sure it did. Speculation. Yeah. Right. Not in a negative Willing way. Willing to right. do anything it took. Right. That's right. my point. Right. Right. So, and I wanted to ask you specifically about the Hernandez um, episode. Yeah. I, yeah. I, that, that, that's really powerful. Mm. I thought that was a really, really mm. strong episode. Um, and we talk a lot about all the, would you say over 70 people were interested yeah, yeah, for yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brandon Lloyd. Yeah. Like, how did you come up with? You know, his you his locker it? was next to the his locker was next that to because I thought he you because know, that, and, it's and, as simple as that it's like, all it is goes, and as a guy that was I was in that locker room I was covering those teams yeah. I covered from from 1999 Fred hired me and I've been here ever since Brandon Lloyd's not a guy that would have been front of mind for me yeah but, but his, man when he started to speak do not go out with yeah yeah Chico. yeah right. and the answer is this Just West Welker West Welker, right West Welker was next to his locker. I had no idea. You know, that's like one of those see, things. See, I knew some of the Welker see, stuff. See, I didn't know see, the any thing of is, the Brandon Lloyd you, connection. I didn't even realize, like, you know, I'm not a fan. I don't know how NFL locker rooms are situated. And I, what is it, by number? Whatever the reason was. Large, that they largely all, by number. Yeah, sure. okay. So whatever Position it was, group, yeah. they happened to be next to each other, right? And I didn't know that. And then when I when we found that out, that's the reason you went and you, you find that person because he was there. He witnessed Terrific. these things. It's the simplest answer in the entire world. So, Jeff, um, you are in New England. Okay, and maybe a little bit used to the personalities northeast corridor. Not that you're not used, Matt, to northeast corridor. I asked Matt this: Are you surprised at what has bubbled up from inside the six-state region with this and all the reaction to it? Um, probably not that much, just um, because I do live here, and I. <laughs> I, I admit I do listen to some you listen talk to Nitwit radio, radio sometimes when I'm driving around. Thanks, Jeff. And um, <laughs> you know everybody. I had a guy come up to me yesterday uh, when I was over at Harvard. Who, he said, "I hate to admit this, but I was listening to EEI this morning." He said, "Don't tell anybody." <laughs> you know, but I the truth is I think a lot of people listen to it because they can't help themselves because they're huge sports fans oh, yeah. up here, yeah. and, and I listen to it. So I've you know I know how how we we can be here. I don't know that it's the same though. When we say the all all six states in New England, like I, I live in Connecticut, and um, there's a lot of people in Boston who don't necessarily even c- consider Connecticut sure. part of New England. It's an a lot of people of in New Connecticut York. who yeah. don't want to be right. part of New England. That, that's right, because right, right. half of our state is yeah. w- considers themselves New Yorkers. New York, right. Right. Yeah. And so where I live, uh, which isn't that far from Gillette, um, people don't feel the same way that they do within the 128 corridor. And there isn't the angst where I live about the, the docuseries because, I, I mean, there's 
there's a lot of people talking about it down there and we have local radio there that talks about it and the tenor is a lot different than it is up here within the 617-508 area code but yeah i i wasn't surprised but i also like, i actually think it's good for the series um to have to not have everybody like taking a Blowing victory kisses. lap yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean i and the the idea that most of the um you know the arguing and fighting is going on right here is kind of a good thing it, it sort of reminds me of a family you know yeah. that's yeah. what it's like sure. that's great. but don't <laughs> you better not say anything about my family right but if i want to ball yeah. out my it's, brother it's for the, being a it's jerk the, it's the tom jackson thing yeah. we can say things about our coach but right. you can't that's right. Right. exactly right and that was the part and you touched on that earlier too yeah you know and you mentioned when they rallied behind belichick after spygate and they went on this run yeah. i would argue that they rallied behind tom jackson and then won 21 games in a row yeah, and, I mean, I, and, and Bill, when Tom Jackson said that, yeah, yeah, they rallied around the Tom Jackson comment. Right, right, right. right. That when, yeah. and that's right. Yeah. When yeah. Tom Jackson said that, that's what. No, I know. Tom oh, was yeah. on a on yeah, a wildcat yeah. strike. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Tom Brady was all, growing all, a beard. All leading up to the great, and then he says all, that, and all then leading up to the great moment, the great moment that was in Jeff's book, which was one of my favorites, is at the end of that Super Bowl. I think Tom Jackson is on some stage at the Super Bowl, and Bill walks up and says, "F you." Yeah. Right. I don't think they've really spoken. I don't think they've really spoken since. Look. If I had, if I had, you know, like these are, I mean, I know that's great, right? But I just felt that we, that the, that that episode, that the, the episode four was just more fascinating to me. I know yeah. it's all great. Yeah. yeah. And, so, and, and again, so speaking, so oh, go ahead. I just, you know, yeah. not like, I understand the difference between a documentary and sort of a highlight video. Yeah. And I totally agree. I don't need the, I know what happened. I was at all the games, yeah, yeah, yeah. like all the other Patriots fans. Some of them are not looking at it that way they should. Because mm. it's a documentary. It's a different vehicle. Yeah. So I didn't need like a recap of the 21 game winning streak yeah. and then going to Houston and winning the Super Bowl and going to Jacksonville and all that. And, and, and I just thought that was a really pivotal moment. Because a lot of those players were really tight with Lloyd Malloy, and a lesser right. coach could have lost the locker room. But it, but there was also well, Tom there were, Jackson. But, but, he did. But there I were mean, many other instances. Like I, I just where that think happened. that's a fascinating moment <clears throat> in history. Yeah. So that leads to the question, Matt. And yeah. I don't know if you had a preconceived notion in this with the book and the success of the book and everything. Mm. Was there an intended audience for this documentary? Because I heard and read you say. Films does a great job with America's Game. Yeah. Films does a great job with Three Games to Glory Three. Like. This is. Are you mining new territory here? Because you know that uh, that uh, those other works exist. Yeah, I think that that gave me the confidence when I made the choices of what, the kind of story that I wanted to tell and the team wanted to tell, my team wanted to tell. That, you know, <clears throat> look, this has all been out there before. It's been covered so many times. Not only did, did films cover it. But Tom Brady covered the sure. Lawyer Malloy sure. thing because Tom was very close to Lawyer Malloy. They had just done the commercial together and all, you know, it was just like all sorts of stuff. They were close. I just felt so many different people, including Jeff, had done it in a really, really great way. And, it, and I guess if I feel like I'm answering the question and, and, and there are, and, and that question is leading me towards something that, that isn't the conventional timeline version of this, which, why do I feel this? Why do I? I'm not going to have any remorse or regret over saying I'm going to skip over these things. And truthfully, one of the things that really was the thing that gave me that was when Pioli said the line about addiction, and he says, he says, look, you know, your relationship with the drug starts to change. At first, when you win, there's elation, and then after a little while, it's just relief, and then when you lose, it's dark. And you'll do anything you can to keep it going. And that was one of those moments where it was like, uh, that was one of those things that was just like, oh, uh, well, you know, I told you how we had cut the, 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 the version of the 03 season and all this stuff. Well, at the end of that, or, or at the end of the 04 season, we, we, would, we, would, we would always get to Pioli's line. And it just felt in a way like we were doing all this stuff that was just kind of getting us further and further away from getting to Pioli's line because that was the mm. next thought. I had worked for this guy for a long time that had a little sticker on his uh, his computer that he worked off of and the sticker said oh that's interesting tell me something new and he, his theory was a filmmaker, he's a great director, he's won an Oscar etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. He's he was, that's what you want the audience to be thinking 
every time they every word every sentence every scene is oh that's interesting now what kind mm -hmm. of right and so <clears throat> in a way as infuriating as I'm sure it is for a lot of fans which I understand there was an element of those that just kept getting in the way of now what and so the next the answer to now what was getting to Pioli's lines faster and let's see the next chapter of this thing when everything changes and that and that and that and 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 because otherwise it you know you're not really getting further along in the answering of the question yeah you talk about the creative decisions you made along the way do you care to share maybe how some of the sausage was made between maybe even the two of you you know creative people in a work of this magnitude there's going to be disagreements oh all the time did you guys like have it out at any time or with, with some of the other producers or yeah, there was or? there's con it, not just between me and Jeff, but also like, um, oh, gosh, I'm trying to think of some of them. I mean, there would be times where we would be. T OK, so for example, in episode 10, we break out into the footage of uh, Bill. This is when I was wrong about something. I'm going to tell this version. Uh, we in in the series break out into the footage of Bill with the team when he's showing the like Rams footage and stuff like that, right? There's this moment where we like leave the Super Bowl and I thought and I and my my lead editor, uh, longtime collaborator Dan Kohler is the one who sort of had this idea to do this, to break away from the Super Bowl and actually show some of this stuff. I was I was thinking, I don't want to leave the energy of the Super Bowl. I don't want to do this. Like this is a bad idea. And we got into like like we would get into fights about it, right? And I would just be like, look, just don't do it. And he's just like, I'm positive. You gotta do this, you gotta do this. To the point where I had to pull like five people mm, really? and, and say, <laughs> I think this guy's nuts. Like, you know, he's got it all wrong. We shouldn't leave the Super Bowl. And everybody was like, no, you got your head up your ass. Like, <laughs> he's right. You're wrong. And when I heard that enough times, I said, all right, I'm wrong. And I just said, let's go for it. And I think it's really, really important. And Jeff and I have talked about this a lot. You've got to surround yourself with people who are willing to tell you when you have your head up your ass. Yeah. And... There is an adversarial, I think, adversarial but but good relationships that have moments of, of, you know, tension and everything, creative tension, is what makes for great things. Yeah. I think that happened here a lot in this building with between Tom and Bill. Without that question. makes for yeah. greatness yeah. Right. because people are pushing each other to get to their best, and there are going to be disagreements, and you just have to make sure that you know, my, and you know, this is what we talk. This is what Mike, Michael Holly talks about. You just got to make sure that as you obtain success, that you kind of don't get to the point where you don't want to hear the nays, the, the nos anymore, and you and you you want to make sure you're surrounded by those people still for yeah. a very very long time. I think that might have affected Belichick a little bit as the brain drain happened with his coaches. You know, there were less, you know, uh, veteran coaches in the room to kind of push back on. Well, and yeah. like let's not not just that, but just like let's think about when Ernie Adams left, right? I, yeah. I still believe I, I, I believe yeah. to this day that the Raiders game where there was the lateral that then Chandler Jones came and got it and scored the defensive touchdown on. I still believe to this day that Ernie Adams would have been in every ear of every coach that was on the field at the time saying repeatedly, if this happens, they take a knee, they don't start to do laterals, make sure this doesn't happen. I think that there was a lot of people like that. Now Skarnecki, is, you know, and it, it, all those, the, all those people, Pioli, all the people that were there that were always thinking about all the other stuff. When that stuff leaves, it changes things. And it, and this is, again goes back to this line that Pioli has in the tenth episode. I said, well, you know, I, I I asked him the question that you know everybody has to ask and everybody wanted to know, even though it is as well. I'll I'll say the question. I agree with Scott on this. I say, so was it more Bill or was it more Tom? I thought that was brilliantly and, placed. And, that and he goes, it's disrespectful. It's disrespectful. It's disrespectful to everybody who came through this building over the last 20 years. And and he doesn't just mean the players. He means everyone. Yeah, I thought Pioli was a star in this, by the way. He was great. We've had opportunities to talk to Scott. And I think, you know, some of it you go, really, does he believe that or anything like that? Or is he just shining our shoe? But I think Scott, after his time here, has become very reflective. I think that's and right. And I think the narcotic line that, you know, was was really all of us. And it were means just like, a lot to him Whoa. in his personal life as you well. You know, I think there's, you there's look a at lot him. Of there, yes. There's a I don't lot think, of depth to some of the stuff. Yeah, that's I don't think said. he liked himself. I think if he looks back at himself now in hindsight, I'm not sure he loves the way he was 
back in the day. You guys should interview. You guys we should, have. Oh, we did. Okay. We, we did. We, we did oh, for okay. an hour just like this. We did oh, an okay, hour. Great. Okay, okay, good. Some of that stuff come up. Yeah, no, no, I know, and I think that there has. And look, that's the best that all of us can do, right? We look back on the mistakes we've made, and we do a lot of self-reflection and a lot, a lot of self-scouting, and we figure out, you know, what did we do wrong? What could we have done better? And I think that, the, you know, then what you see is with the guy, he he talks about it, like he's done a lot of that stuff, and and I think that, uh, you know, um, when we got him, we got him at a place where he was very thoughtful about this, and he really hadn't had the opportunity. Same with Ernie to really be on the record on at least in film because they both. I think talked to um, Halberstam when Education of the Coach was written, but they really hadn't had a chance through all these things that were made. They'd never really been on the record before and actually talked about this stuff. And it was an opportunity for them to really tell their side of the story, just like it was an opportunity for all these players who really were, in a lot of ways, not front and center right. and to tell their side of the story. So I think I'd heard you say something about when somebody asked you while you guys have been on tour, you know, what's the big fish sure, that got sure. away? He makes it sound like I'm on a bus like going <laughs> yeah, from town no, to town. No, you you're know. in a you're in a Gulf Stream. Um, <laughs> yeah, I wish. That uh, me and Jeannie probably was on your list. He didn't talk. So let's move Eric all over to the side. Uh -huh. Is there somebody in your guys' mind, you talked to sev over 70 people, is there somebody that you mm. said, I wish we could have gotten him or her? I the the honest answer is now looking back the answer is really no there isn't one person that i think oh if we had just gotten this person it would have been because I, I think i was very conscious of ernie and scott are going to be the people along with mcdaniel who, who can who can come in and talk about the perspective from the coaching along with bill obviously but um who were the people that were Tom's friends that can speak for can can speak in addition to Tom for him from his perspective, his family members, you know, whoever. Alex and and Alex, yeah, being able to interview Alex. I thought Nancy Brady was fantastic. She was amazing. Throughout. She was fantastic. amazing. Amazing. Um, there are interviews on the cutting room floor that were great interviews. We talked about skipping over. We, I know we keep coming back to skipping over thirty eight and thirty nine. Rodney Harrison did a three hour long interview that is incredible. It's on the cutting room floor. We have a little bit of it in, but basically the extent of him is, is you know, in the middle of episode four, he says, you know, F them all kind mm -hmm. of thing, right? That was like, that was, but that yeah. interview was incredible. Do you have the rights to come out after the fact? With it's Apple. Yeah, it's Apple. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's the easy answer. It's Apple. It's, right. it's, and so, you know, I got to talk to Rex Ryan, right? And, and, you know, I asked Rex, I asked Rex Ryan, I said, Rex, I'm really sorry to do this, but can you tell me about the foot video? And because uh, the whole thing, and then I went to Wes Welker and I said, Wes, that press conference you did when you found a way to work the word feed in to yeah. every single answer you gave for about an hour was one of the best press conferences I've ever seen in my entire life. And Rex Ryan, while we were interviewing, said that he actually sent Wes Welker a pair of like rubber feet to his oh, wedding. Oh, <laughs> see, that's great. Right? So, yeah, yeah. Is there, is, good is, for Rex. Does Apple want, does Apple want a director's cut or something? You got to you got to yeah. call you got to call them and make it happen, yeah. man. Yeah. So. so can I ask you a, a, a lighter-hearted thing? So yeah, wait, Rex Ryan's foot thing wasn't no, lighthearted no, no, enough yeah. for you. <laughs> but but, but um, you know, I don't necessarily mean this as serious as it sounds. So you're you're the at the end, one, nine or ten uh, or toward the end the malcolm butler stuff yeah and you ask bill about malcolm not playing and he says we've already been over that and you rightly say well <laughs> I, I just asked yeah you. yeah um there's nobody that does the awkward pause like bill belichick yeah and he will wait you out forever mm. and as someone like you now mm -hmm. that has been on the other side of one of those awkward pauses what did it feel like i don't know it, it, see the thing is I think when you've been here for a long time, he has been mythologized and talked about and built up, and he is, and he is the greatest coach of all time. And I'm not trying to downplay his accomplishments at all, but I felt like, and I sort of felt the same. I mean, I, I was interested and excited to talk to these guys, but it wasn't like, oh my gosh, what is this going to, you know? Oh, you didn't I'm, 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 I'm like Chris shaking. Getting Chris Farley at on. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, and so and so I always, you know. I, what I kept talking, thinking about was in that 07 season, they play the Redskins. They, they, they're up like, you know, 40 something to nothing. To fourth the down. They're, you know, they couldn't, they, they could, they could take a knee at that point. They score another touchdown. And afterwards, Bill Belichick's asked and he, they say, well, why'd you do that? He says, what do you want me to do? Kick a field goal? <laughs> right. That's what we love about Bill. Yeah. We love the Bill that was all, was it against Gase or whoever it was when he kept doing all the false starts things to, to eat the clock up? He didn't like it as much when Vrabel was Vrabel doing it to him. Right. But yeah. Right. But my point is, that's what people love about Bill Belichick. He, he 
he never he takes his foot off the gas. He never takes his foot off the gas. Yeah. He doesn't care. He just does the thing that he's supposed to do, which is to win games and do what's best for the team. And so when I went, when I when I got to talk to him, I was just like, well, I'm just going to ask him the same questions I ask everybody else. Yeah. You know, Ernie got all the same questions. You know, yeah. why why wasn't Malcolm Butler playing? And or or what about Hernandez? Ernie answered that question. You know, and 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 then when we got to that one, he's going to get asked. It's an important question to ask Bill Belichick yeah, about. You have to do it. Yeah. And I just wanted um, just some individuals quick, the guys that are involved in the scandals. Oh, okay. uh, Matt Walsh with Spygate, John Jastrzemski. Uh, I never reached uh, out. McNally did never reached out. Okay, yeah. I mean, th- there that would have been a, an opportunity, I, I guess, to get some information. That would have been a forensic be, examination of did they do it or didn't they do it? Right. And that wasn't the question that I was ever trying to answer. Right. So th- in, with the Flategate. The, the, the thing that I always try to find these things that are like, this is the guiding principle through everything, right? For Deflategate, it was this. We found this piece of archive. It's the Today Show. It's Matt Lauer. He starts off and he says, we lead our stories Fantastic. today with the ongoing Deflategate investigation. This is when it's like back and forth in the courts and stuff. Then a few stories later, he goes, you and in other news, <laughs> right. ISIS has beheaded another hostage. Right. What a, a trade right. that was. The transition ending. was yeah. so great. Absolutely. And I saw that. I saw that and I was like, all right, that's it. This whole thing is a farce, like, right? That's what this whole thing is going to be. The whole episode is, right? Yes, we get into all the details. We get into like what's said about from one side to the other, but it's just about the lunacy behind the idea that an equipment violation, even if he did it, even if he did, would take up, become a two-year national news story that was consumed to the level where something like ISIS was a secondary Back news burner. story. Yeah. yeah. That, that was it. So, you, you, you know, we talk about these things. What's the one sentence thing that just triggers everything? That's it. That's the guiding principle. And, and so the entire thing was, how is this thing a farce? Right. It, and, and yes, I'm not trying to say that we skirt over whether or not the evidence is one side or another. But what was much more interesting in that entire thing was it's a farce. Right. Try covering it. It's insane. Right. Yeah. So, Matt, here's a chance to give a shout out to some of the people because. You need a team of people to find that Matt Lauer oh, Today yeah. Show broadcast. Yeah. You need you need so, a team of people that's oh, yeah. sitting there looking for in another news. Fifty of them. Right. What was what was that like? I mean, I know what it's like for our little library here, but I think what really makes the series are some of the audio and visual montages 100%. about some of the scandals or the O seven season when they're rolling over everybody. Those are wildly entertaining, and that takes a huge team of people to put. Yeah. That so Matt Fisher is our, our lead archival producer. Then he has a bunch of producers that are working with him: Vindy Anton, Paul Williard, um, Riley Bloom. Riley, Riley, I think came in here and looked through some stuff. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did time here. I love that. <laughs> um, so that's the beginning of it. Then there's a team of loggers whose job is to just comb through this stuff and and say and put markers in where there's something they then we had different colors of markers that would be like just ordin you know, like I can't remember what the what the actual color combination you know, words were, but it was like uh What's going on out there? There's a lawnmower outside. <laughs> right, right. <clears throat> um there would be like, you know uh yellow would be okay green would be this could be good then there would be like purple or magenta would be like okay this is going in the cut you know there would be all these levels so they would go through all of this stuff and start doing and and there was a team of people all over the country because we were we started this thing during covid still so we our system was set up so that you could be anywhere in the country and just sort of beam in and and Mm -hmm. and work on it and so they would make all these things i will never forget we were in the middle of cutting the first cut of the aaron hernandez episode and Paul Williard, one of these people, walks in and it doesn't walk in. He he, it's, I'm, I'm ima- imagining it as if we were in an office, but we weren't. He, on Slack, basically video messages me and he says, "I just found this stuff from the rookie symposium." Yeah, that was and, great too. And and he's looking at this and he's just he's just he was just skimming through footage and all of a sudden he sees this moment where Chris Carter is sitting there and he's he's saying, "This is the fork in the road for a lot of you guys." This is where you separate yourself from your friends and you, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And it's like that finding that footage completely reshaped the entire structure and the, and the of that. And the fact that Hernandez asked a question. Right. I mean, he must have yeah. thought he found the treasure, the buried treasure. Yeah. Like, you know. Yeah. But there was a, there was a bunch of those things yeah. like that. But that that reshaped everything because then it was, OK, we'll we have, we'll introduce the draft room and the limited things that they knew. We'll have seen Dion talking about it a little bit, and then we'll sort of go back in time 
and we'll start with Aaron's childhood, and then we'll very slowly get back to the rookie symposium, and then basically it's now he joins the team. Finding that footage completely changed how we told the entire structure of that episode. And that's the thing you talked about, like, well, do the interviews inform how you do things and change the way you're looking at things? The footage, would it change and inform things just as much? Yeah. And it was just this journey that we were constantly on yeah. uh, to try to figure yeah, out. I would to, say for anyone that is interested, go to IMDb and look at the dynasty and you'll see the cast of that you had helping. With it, this it, thing. it was there was there was there was eight editors. Yeah. Right. And some of them. Some of them were uh, Vin Dienton, who was the producer on the thing. He's a diehard Giants fan. So every time we would go, he would sometimes come onto set and he would be there for the Teddy Bruschi interview. He never told anybody this, and certainly not Teddy, but he always had an 18 and one t-shirt underneath <laughs> his button up, oh. right? right? That was his little thing that he, you know, he would do, right? But then there was also people, uh, Freddie Shanahan and uh, Nick Biagetti, they grew, both grew up like two towns outside of Foxborough. And these were guys that had the uh, the Homeland Defense posters, you know, from back in the day. They had them above their bed. And I still remember I had to call and get uh, fact check confirmation for something from Teddy at one point in time. And I just told one of them, I said, hey, come on my Zoom for a second. And I, they didn't understand why. And then we and then we uh, Zoomed with, with Teddy. He pops on. And I just said, take a second, take 30 seconds and tell Teddy how much you, you know, how much That's you awesome. love him. <laughs> and it, for them, it was just like they got to meet their hero. That's great. You know? And so it was a mixed bag of people who were like some of the people were diehard Patriots fans. And some people were our line producer, Laura McCune. She grew up in Buffalo. And, and, and that was another conversation I had to have with people. They were just said, oh, I can't do this. I can't work on the project that is going to, you know, is going to be about the Patriots because I just I, my family won't my family will disown me. You know, and da -da 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 on all this kind of stuff, and they would say that, and then I'd just be like, "Look, we're gonna not do the wedding video. This is gonna be the unvarnished truth, and it and it's just gonna be what people talk about, and that's it." Yeah. And so, so as we wrap things up, Jeff, I just was I wanted to ask you, you know, when you see this thing, you've got an idea in your head, you're gonna pitch this book. Do you pinch yourself now that that book, which is a New York Times bestseller, is now? one of the most highly trafficked streamed number, docuseries. Number one on Amazon. There you go. Just a, a little, plug, little there, uh, plug. Number one on Amazon. Ahead of Tom Brady's TB12 method, by yeah. the way. Yeah. Jeff yeah. Benedict. <laughs> you mean Apple. What? You mean Apple. Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. But anyway, my point is he beat Tom Brady, okay? Yeah. What? How does that make you feel? It's great. I mean, I, it's, I, it's great to see, you know, something like this at the end of a very long road. It's, very, it's rewarding and satisfying, and um, it's great for my family kids love it um yeah friends and neighbors it's fun i know, i, I asked is. matt before if he's working on anything he's taking some time off mm -hmm. anything in the works for you yeah i mean i i'm a writer i have to work all the time yeah <laughs> it's no time off um C care to share or? i can't okay i can't but uh, all right yeah i am i am i know but as ernie adams would say there are some things i'm taking, I'm taking to the, taking grave. To the right. grave right grave okay matt jeff Thank you very much for joining us. It was wildly entertaining. Um, it's gotten a lot of, uh, I mean, I believe that the talk and the opinions and the tweets and everything like that have got to be good for business. Um, it wasn't a straight line with this organization to greatness and, you know, the ultimate dynasty. But I think you guys did a very, it was very entertaining, very thoroughly researched. Uh, interviewed the whole nine yards and uh, can't thank you enough for joining us. Thanks for so much Thanks for having for, me. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you.